everyone. Thanks for coming out to our second speaker in our guest speaker series. Tonight we have Dr. Eric Burt, and he's going to talk to us about Sherman's 15th Army Corps. And you'll notice we've got some Civil War era artifacts pulled. Y'all are welcome to come up and take a look once the presentation's over. Um, as far as our speaker goes, Dr. Burt earned his PhD in history from University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And he is the historian for Army University Press. And prior to going to grad school, he was an Army enlisted infantryman serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Burt. All right, thank you so much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the friends of the museum and everybody involved in that. I want to talk a little bit uh, tonight about a book that I've written, which is uh, going to be coming out by LSU Press this fall. Uh, it kind of encapsulates my research into uh, Civil War tactics uh, related to the American Civil War, but also uh, infantry tactics associated with 19th century land warfare writ large. Uh, and when I say tactics, and when people say tactics, some people's brains turn off and other people's brains turn on. Uh, they, they kind of assume there's going to be a whole lot of arrows and maps, which there will be. Uh, but I also think about tactics and write about tactics and study about tactics in, in a fundamentally different way than a lot of people do. And that's that I think of them as, as cultural artifacts. And there's a whole lot of different definitions of culture. Term that we colloquially use, we bandy it about in different ways. Uh, and this is my kind of personal working definition of it. It's not the, the be all end all, but it's something that, that I find useful. Uh, culture is, is, a, is a web or a constellation of values, beliefs, norms, ideas, uh, things that people think in a way that so many of them in a group think of them that it tends to collectively inform or rather inform their collective behavior in a group. And there are people who feel that. There are certain benchmarks of when culture appears and when it doesn't. Certain people think that uh, there have to be multiple generations of a, of a group in order for values and beliefs and things to be passed on uh, to, to each generation. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's required. Um, I think that you know anybody who's ever served in a jury or been on a uh, you know a pickup basketball team or any any spontaneous group after a, a very short period of time develops ideas, share ideas and norms based on their experience together as a group, regardless of how long that group's been around. And those ideas then inform and, uh, they don't necessarily dictate, but they inform their behaviors and their decision making and, and so on and so forth. So that relates to tactics, which, uh, you know, the Army defines very rigidly, but I will just define as the methods by which military organizations and military groups go about prosecuting their assigned objectives. Um, it relates to culture in that the, the manner in which soldiers and officers as groups uh, go about deciding what they're going to do uh, in relationship to the orders that they're given and the manner in which they go about uh, doing those things are informed by their collective ideas about the relative efficacy of certain tactics, which simply means what they think is going to work, uh, given the, the problem at hand and why they think it's going to work. Um, and those things come from, from learning. They come from uh, repetitive experiences that collectively they think about and they talk about as a group in the aftermath of those experiences. And then tactical culture is developed in this, in this kind of cycle. Right? I, I promise this is as theoretical as the whole thing will get. But groups perceive things, right? They, they experience things. In terms of a military unit, they, they go into battle, let's say for the first time, and they, uh, they, they witness things, they, they do things, they perceive things. Uh, that tend to alter their preconceived notions of the way battle is going to be, or of the things that you're supposed to do in combat. You know, they, they act, they take action, they make decisions together, they act together, they fight, they win, they lose, whatever. And then in the aftermath, then they, re they consider what just happened. They sit around in a civil war, they sit around a campfire, they sit around a camp. They, they talk, they smoke and joke, they do whatever. Uh, but, but in that process emerges a, a story about what happened, what we just went through, what it means, what we learned about it. And that in turn makes the full circuit 
and informs the way that they perceive the next engagement or experience that they have. So in practice, it kind of looks like this. You've got a, you've got a, you know, a Civil War regiment here, a, a United States Volunteer Regiment going to battle, and uh, you know, these are just kind of concepts that are arising in their mind, maybe, right? Like, what, what kind of problem is this are we facing? Uh, this guy's thinking, we can do this, I know we can, this is just like we did last time, so we can totally pull this off. This guy's thinking something that very few people probably have ever thought, we can trust the generals, they know what they're doing, right? Uh, because these are things that they have from experience, or if not from experience, then that they've intuited from popular culture or whatnot in their time, that these things are true, and this is the way to go about doing business. Now, in the aftermath, things didn't go real well. Then you get things like this. You know, they're sitting around playing cards. The guy, I think all the generals were maybe drunk. Uh, and the guy says, hey, I think we should have attacked a different way than we attacked. And the other one says, hey, I can't believe they actually expected us to do that. Can you believe that? Can we trust those guys to be giving us orders next time? So as this happens, which is a very informal, not top-down process, uh, you know, in fact, it's not even bottom up because there is no, unlike today, where you've got the, the Center for Army Lessons Learned, you've got these formal processes built into the United States Army, whereby after action reports can be gleaned from, uh, from the bottom up and then they can be analyzed at, at echelon. That didn't exist in the Civil War. It's literally just a bunch of guys sitting around on barrels talking about what just happened. And that is, in turn, what forges the way these units think. Now, the other vitally important aspect of what makes the United States Army during the Civil War useful for studying these questions is the way that personnel management was handled during the Civil War. So unlike today, where when units take losses for one reason or another, either because of combat or because people leave to go on to other units or jobs or whatnot, in the Civil War, these volunteer units shrunk over time, sometimes dramatically. This is a, a recreation I did of, of one company in the 116th Illinois in 1861, and then this is the same company in 1863. They didn't bring in replacements much. It did happen, but it wasn't at scale, predominantly because the Lincoln administration wanted to use the opportunities to raise new units in order to parcel out more commissions for colonels and other officer positions that could be given to uh, political entities that weren't necessarily all on board with the Republican presidential administration's agenda. And so if they could offer officer commissions and by raising new regiments, then they could receive some patronage benefits as a result. Now, in the field, it led to this, where you've got not a whole lot of new people coming into these units. So these individuals are all incorporated into the bigger unit. They're not new people, and there's no new people added. And because of that, they've got, this is a, an encapsulation of uh, all of the experience that that unit has gone through over two years. There's not a whole lot of turnaround, and that's important for the organization and, and movement of ideas throughout the unit. So uh, as this uh, you know, tactical manual that you got laid out here uh, is, is, is displaying, Civil War soldiers were, were drilled in a, a very uniform, systematic way. They were taught how to be soldiers. You know, they, they volunteered from you know the cornfields or the city streets. They knew absolutely nothing about the military. Their officers, for the most part, the, the, the volunteer officers knew almost nothing about the military or tactics or anything like that. I tell people it's, it's very similar to if you just decided you wanted to raise a tactical battalion to uh, you know, go shore up NATO defenses in, in Poland, and uh, you decided that you were going to go just take a straw poll of your community and get a bunch of people together and say, hey, let's go be 3rd Battalion of Missouri Volunteer Infantry, right? Like, and that you would have, you know, not speaking for anybody's actual personal expertise, but uh, you would have about the same amount of military knowledge as the two million men who, who fought for the, the Union during the Civil War. The assumption was that by following these manuals, volunteers would be able to be converted into functional soldiers that would then be able to serve under the auspice of regular army officers who, who knew ostensibly what they were doing. Uh, and through this systematic process of education and training, these individuals would effectively become soldiers from experience. Now, the problem with all of that, or not the problem, but the, 
the caveats, it's important for us to understand a little bit about Civil War infantry tactics, just the, the, the basic 101, which often gets lost. And one question I get asked more than anything else is why did Civil War soldiers fight in lines? Why did they just stand there? Why did they uh, you know, not, not hide behind something, and so on and so forth? Well, what I'm about to, to tell you over the course of the evening is that they did a lot of that. Um, the, the, the two things that are really imperative for you to understand about uh, not just Civil War infantry tactics, but 19th century and even 18th century uh, infantry tactics, is that it's about balancing these two, what are called the destructive and decisive acts. An infantry unit being, you know, Bunch of guys with guns, right? And, and in this era, with bayonets, like this one, on the end of those guns. The key being that the bayonet is meant as a, a uh, to, to, to strike fear in the heart of the enemy. It's not actually intended to be used in stabbing people outright. It's meant to point at people and say, if you don't move, I'm gonna stab you. And that's a really persuasive argument to be made uh, if, if you're on the battlefield, right? Some of that is because in an era that, you know, in the 17th and 18th centuries, that these, that these weapons were first used at, at, at scale, um, the odds of hitting somebody with your smoothbore musket from any but absolute point blank range was low. And so, therefore, uh, there was a debate that, that, that raged all through the two centuries about, you know, how do we balance fire, which is the destructive act, with the decisive act, or the moral act, which is charging with the bayonet? How much destructive firepower at point blank range does it take to weaken an enemy unit enough that when you charge with the bayonet, they all run away? Because they just, they don't want to be there anymore. They're convinced that you're going to wipe them off the face of the planet if they continue to stand. There are armies like the French army that at the, during much of the 18th century and then part of the, the 19th with some, some weird things that happened during the Napoleonic era, um, lend themselves more toward a, an, an excessive use of the bayonet and less of fire. And you've got the British army that, that is the opposite of that. They lean more on the destructive effects than of the decisive acts. But both, but all armies, to include the United States army, hunted for some balance in between the two, right? Some fire, some maneuver, not all one, not all the other. And in the 19th century, after the, especially after the Napoleonic conflicts and the, and the, the French Revolutionary Wars, you start to see a lot more of this. This is called a skirmish line, which is individuals kicked out from the main battle line who spread out a, you know, a handful of paces uh, apart from one another. And they, they get behind cover, they kneel down, they lay down. It's difficult but not impossible to fire a percussion muzzle-loading rifle from laying down or kneeling, contrary to popular belief. It can be done, it was in this manual. Uh, but the importance of this line and its function is what you're gonna see changing in a lot of military units during the Civil War and especially after. However, it's the, the most important thing to understand is that the, emph the emphasis, the tactical emphasis that's put on this line, or this line, or how many yards apart they are, or even how they're used, is not something that existed in army doctrine at all. How to form this line, or how to form this line, or how to get a move in that way, or how to get a move in this way, that's all in the book. But when, or why, or how to do any of that, there's no instructions. And so for that reason, all of it has to be developed independently within these units by experience. And thus you get a, pro a process whereby some units are all about skirmishers. Other units aren't about skirmishers at all. Some units are all about use of the bayonet, other units aren't so much. And it's not just the commanders, it's the, the units as a collective whole themselves by way of the process that I, that I laid out. This is just once more elaborating the, the, the difference between fire, maneuver, or the destructive and decisive act as we understand it today. <clears throat> so just a, a quick note about how I go about um, you know, determining these things, because I can't interview these people, right? They've been dead for over a century. Um, and for that reason, there's a lot of things that I would like to know, there's a lot of things I'd like to ask that, that I can't possibly ascertain. Um, but in order to, to figure out what these patterns are, first you have to identify that there were patterns, right? You have to go back uh, into the, the battle reports that are, for the most part, tabulated in the, the official 128 volumes 
of the official record of the War of Rebellion, uh, you know, other printed and, and, and manuscript records associated with these, these original uh, reports. There's the art that sometimes has to be leaned on because if things weren't written down, uh, and then obviously maps. And, and, and then once you have ascertained what happened, then the most important bit is figuring out what they thought about what happened and what sense they made of what happened. And that comes out in soldier letters, it comes out most especially in diaries that weren't written intentionally for public uh, digestion. They, they wanted to uh, you know, record their thoughts privately about the things that they had gone through. The most valuable lines that I look for are, well, all the boys say, or all the men have in the unit suggest that this is what their experience was, so on and so forth. That's really useful for me because that expands the horizon beyond just what this one individual thought, which is imperative when all I've got to work with are you know, two or three individuals out of a hundred man company uh, or, or regiment or whatnot. So the book is about the 15th Corps, and just to give you a kind of quick and dirty version of, of how big the Corps is, uh, it's about 30,000 men, give or take, uh, and, and every Corps is made up of, you've got this hierarchical successive um, organizational scheme that comes directly out of uh, Napoleon's Grand Armée during the Napoleonic Wars. You've got a corps that's more or less three or four divisions, or two or three divisions in, in this case. Uh, each division is two or four brigades, and each brigade is comprised of about two to five regiments, give or take. Again, all of this stuff changes over the course of the conflict and how many people are available, and these numbers most especially drop precipitately course of the conflict uh, just by virtue of lacking manpower. Uh, what's important for me and for this discussion is that each of these blocks all the way down to the smallest block is an idiosyncratic particular body of experience. So each regiment, each one of the you know, 40 plus regiments that comprises the corps has experienced a given battle in its own unique specific way, and more importantly, has come out of that and collectively thought about what happened in a specific, unique way. So every regiment isn't the same. They haven't all gone through, even if they're all in the same battle, they all underwent different experiences of that battle. And even if they have almost exactly the same experiences, they've all thought about it differently, and they've all considered it differently. So the, the drill, and there's not really doctrine in our sense, but insofar as doctrine existed, the idea was that if you train these soldiers the same, they will, in effect, behave the same under various orders. And the only thing that will change is the orders that they're given, and that's based on who the commander is. What I am arguing is that, especially in this era, but also in every era, to a greater or lesser extent, the particular experiences that each unit has had, and the sense that they made of them, is always going to influence the way in which those orders are received, and then how the unit goes about collectively acting on those experiences. Now, I've got to do an enormous amount of just ridiculously migraine-inducing tracking to figure out which regiments are where, within the core, at what time, and how that changes over time, and how that correlates with patterns of sense-making and experience, and you know, who, who experienced what, and who was where, and you know, all those types of things. And as if that wasn't difficult enough, units are not the only groups forging their own unique tactical cultures within civil organizations. You also have command teams. So you've got a, a core command team that has the commander and his division commanders. You've got division command teams that have the division commanders and all their brigadiers. And then you've got brigade command teams that have the brigade commanders and all of their regimental commanders. And each of these are groups with a stable enough membership, and they work closely enough together that they are all forging ideas, shared ideas, beliefs, norms that constitute tactical culture that are going to inform the way that each of them successively interprets and acts upon the orders that they're given. And at the very top of the 15th Corps' command team echelon is this guy, who I'm sure you only know because he helped establish the School of Application for Infantry and Cavalry in 1881. and did nothing else historically significant. Um, this is obviously William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, who was himself, though, a career-long 
professional soldier with a little bit of a gap here to kind of explore his horizons. Um, one thing, a couple things people don't know a lot of about Sherman is that prior to the Civil War, the man had absolutely no combat experience whatsoever. He had never been in battle, like Ulysses S. Grant uh, and many other famous Civil War commanders. Uh, his first seeing the elephant experience, if you will, as they said, was at First Bull Run, which was a very kind of uh, a very kind of tangential role, experience of that, it wasn't, wasn't fully engaged. And so almost the entirety of his combat experience was, was in the Western theater of the Civil War, most of it serving under Ulysses S. Grant. The other thing that is super paradoxical about Sherman, given his reputation now, is that he was a consummate, uh, obsessive, compulsive when it came to order and discipline, especially as they related to the strict preservation of Southern property, to include not only physical property, but at the time, human beings who were being held in bondage by much of the wealthy white elites that lived in the South. He was a, a, uh, a strict political conservative. Uh, he didn't do a whole lot of leaning to the left or right in terms of formal parties, but it was vitally important to him from the beginning of the war until about halfway into the war that the war strictly avoid, the war effort strictly avoid the abolition of slavery and strictly protect what he saw as the inviolable property of Southerners, which obviously once again very contrary to, to his reputation further on. He also, because of his obsession with order, had a very hard time with dealing with large armies of volunteers. He wrote to his brother in January of 1863 to say he can't appreciate the difficulty of molding into a homogenous machine, right? That's what he wants. He wants a predictable, homogenous machine. The discordant elements which go to make up our army. He's, he's constantly frustrated with his seeming inability to turn this rabble of, of volunteers who are motivated but he would argue not quite motivated enough, and not quite motivated enough in the right ways, into this, as you would see in a tactical manual, predictable linear machine that he could deploy that will go out and do his, his bidding on the battlefield. But by January of 1863, he does admit many of these guys are fast becoming soldiers from experience, or in other words, soldiers of a type, they're being changed from civilians into soldiers, not by drill and training, but because of their experiences in battle. As he is himself, I argue, but of course he sees himself as this consummate military professional, he's a West Point graduate, and he assumes that uh, you know, when it comes to war, he essentially walks on water, and uh, everybody else is, is doing it wrong. But in January of 1863, he takes over the brand new 15th Army Corps, which was comprised of troops who about half of which were brand new, and the other half came from two different experience streams, I call them. One from serving under Ulysses S. Grant and, and other Army of Tennessee commanders before him uh, through the what might be called the, uh, you know, the, the Tennessee Valley Campaign of Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, and then through Shiloh, of course, and down into Corinth, Mississippi. Uh, and the other coming from the Trans-Mississippi Theater, serving under predominantly other people as well, Samuel L. Curtis, uh, fighting at Key Ridge and then marching to, to Helena through this very, in 1862, barren wasteland of, of northern Arkansas. And he draws, uh, in order to engage in, in the Corps' first campaign to come down here and attempt to seize Vicksburg uh, very quickly before the Confederate Army, which is facing Grant, can respond and come down here to defend Vicksburg. He draws liberally from these two groups in order to rapidly try to create a core of about uh, 30,000 people, not, not, not just one core, two core of about 30,000 people, so that he can then take a flotilla with all these troops down here to Vicksburg and, and grab it before, uh, before the rebels can, can respond. So to man the two divisions of what is going to be the 15th Corps, because Sherman has a very close relationship to Grant, Grant basically gives him leeway to pick anybody that he wants in order to, uh, to go about achieving this. Uh, he takes these two individuals who are very close friends and confidants, if you will, of William Tecumseh Sherman, the first being Major General Frederick Steele, 
who is in Curtis's army, uh, then uh, in, in Helena, Arkansas. And then this individual, Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith, who I argue was a very unsung hero of, of the Civil War, especially the Civil War in the West, who, uh, Steele is a consular professional like Sherman. He is a regular army officer, a West Point graduate, a, uh, you know, a, a lifetime career officer who frankly had far more experience, had fought in Mexico, had, had served in combat in, in, at, at, at multiple echelons, at multiple even junior uh, commissioned ranks, unlike Sherman. And so Sherman has an enormous amount of respect for this man. Morgan L. Smith, on the other hand, uh, is, is a volunteer officer. He served as a drill sergeant during the Mexican War, had almost no uh, actual, in fact, he had no actual combat experience. Um, but he was wildly popular with the troops because he was uh, one of the most vulgar people you've ever met in your entire life. Uh, and they loved that about him. Uh, he he uh, had a very hard time keeping his temper down, uh, but he was also a consummate tactician because he had served at very junior echelons. He'd served as a drill sergeant in the 1840s. And one thing that he was absolutely fascinated with were what were called French army swabs, which people, a lot of people are familiar with the, the costume, if you will, because it is, it's a uniform, but it looks more like a costume of French swabs, which at the time were very avant-garde, forgive the French, uh, avant-garde um, tactical unit in 19th century warfare. Uh, instead of predominantly fighting in battle lines, in, in mass serried ranks, uh, they typically were uh, you know, encouraged to kind of spread out behind cover and move in kind of loose formations that were dispersed and, and, and utilized their athleticism, the, the technology advances that were associated with percussion rifles as opposed to percussion muskets, to lean a little bit more on the destructive side of things than the maneuver side of things at times, and then other times be able to use their kind of loose formations to instead lean more on the maneuver instead of the fire. So they were seen in many cases as a kind of a perfect blend, a perfect marriage of these two, uh, these two concepts. And he loved swabs, uh, and in fact, his regiment, the 8th Missouri, and another regiment of Indiana swabs, although they weren't attired exactly this way, actually were the only two Union regiments that actually operated as swabs as the, in the way the French would do in the entire war. Though there were many units that called themselves swabs, dressed more like swabs, but operated just like any other unit. So in their first battle as a corps, the whole flotilla comes down the Mississippi, 15th Corps, in, in, involved in all of that. And they deploy on uh, basically the swampy bottomlands of the Yazoo River Valley, and the Yazoo branches off the Mississippi to the east. And the whole this big Pittsburgh's down here. The entire plan here is that Grant is going to take the bulk of the army that isn't with Sherman and move southward down the Mississippi corridor, down the Mississippi Central Railroad. And he's going to essentially link up with Sherman outside Vicksburg, as soon as Sherman sweeps the, 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 the paltry number of rebels who are then defending Vicksburg, because this is a surprise to them, right? That are defending Vicksburg out here on the Walnut Hills to the north of the town. Well, Grant, as it turns out, some of you probably already know the story, doesn't actually make it because his supply lines are cut in northern Mississippi and he doesn't get to go south. Sherman doesn't know this because it's 1862 and there's no way to you know, send a, a, a text. So uh, this is basically bound to fail from the very beginning. And because of that, it's often written off by historians as mostly unimportant because there was no way that it was ever gonna succeed anyway. It's kind of passed over quickly. It's mentioned in paragraphs of the Vicksburg campaign, and then they move on. Um, but for the 15th Corps, this is where they cut their teeth as a, as a brand new organization, right? So these are, these are incipient foundational experiences. And the two things that I want to pay close attention to here, the first one, uh, Morgan Smith, the, the, the suave connoisseur, is, is shot and wounded, unfortunately. And uh, the, the, the character who is most important on his, his arm of the front is his brother, Giles Smith, who takes over uh, uh, with his brigade and is charged with attempting to make a crossing here across that Chickasaw Bayou to attack this unit and, and try to seize this road that runs up and down the Walnut Hills so that they have a corridor to get to Vicksburg. The only problem is the only way to cross 
the bayou, which is essentially a creek full of water, is a very narrow sandbar. Now, there's a lot of ways to go about trying to force a crossing like that. Uh, it's a narrow defile. There's a lot of officers that would have just jammed a lot of troops together, given them all their bayonets, and then rushed them all across all at once and just did some brazen bayonet charge. But Giles is a lot like his brother in that he values the, the suave style conservative approach to gradually using the skill and finesse of his light infantrymen, essentially, to attempt to establish a lodgment. Well, it didn't go real well, but it looks very different from fighting that we would typically, stereotypically associate with the Civil War, right? A lot of these individuals are using cover, they're firing from behind cover, they're moving in small groups, they're organized in small groups on the far bank, and they're maximizing the, the utility of their, the, the accuracy of their rifle muskets in ways that wouldn't be possible if they all had smooth boards, which you can't see here if their soldiers uh, arrayed on, on, on this far bank behind trees for you know, several hundred meters in both directions, trying to take away at the rebels who are on the other side. Uh, it's a disaster. Uh, hundreds die in process, and even more are wounded. Uh, they, they do not carry the breach. But things go even worse elsewhere. So to the west, the other half of the 15th Corps, which is commanded by Steele, right, this consummate regular soldier, a um, number of officers who are uh, you know, not important to go into enormous amounts of detail given our, our time constraints. But what's important is that on this arm, there's, there's also an attempt to get across the body and attack the rebels on the high ground, but with very, very, very different methodology. So all of these troops are, in fact, mashed, masked into serried ranks. They're, they're, they're shoulder to shoulder. Their bayonets are fixed. They've got pretty extensive amounts of open ground to cover before they can attack this, this, these fortified rebels who have a number of disadvantages. They're, they're newer troops. They don't have a lot of ammunition. They don't have a lot of artillery support. But they're dug in one way or the other. And all of these attacks are also miserably disastrous. Uh, you know, hundreds, hundreds of Union soldiers are killed in the process of trying to carry these lines. Uh, there's a massive coordination error that happens over here, whereby only one of these regiments actually makes it across the bayou, and the others are erroneously diverted over here, and they don't even know where they are. There's all sorts of coordination issues added to the fact that as these troops cross this open ground, they are under fire the entire time. They're all new troops. And there's just no way possible that they're realistically going to carry the objective assigned to them. Now, in the aftermath, this is the most important bit. The men assigned these tasks go back to their steamers dejected. They've lost their buddies. They've lost their friends. And they themselves have been traumatized by this repulse. And they say things like, it's a complete madness of Sherman to attack this, I mean, if you go to Vicksburg and you, you look up at the Walnut Hills from the Chickasaw Bayou the battlefield, I mean, they're, they are towering, and we wouldn't even barely need a gun to, to defend them. And yet the, the objective here was cram everybody together and rush them at the hills. Uh, this private says, I don't want to get in any other higher place, at least if I want to, I don't want to have a chance to shoot. Because a lot, of these, a lot of these troops didn't have an opportunity to even return fire. They were just masked and thrown at the breastwork. Uh, Lieutenant Anthony in the 4th Island says, our generals don't understand their business and do not appear to care for the loss of life, no more than when we so many brutes. And then Lieutenant Seward uh, says, the boys think there's some bad mismanagement. Right? And these are, are, are just four examples of sentiment that you can find in any letter or diary entry from anyone in the 30,000 man corps uh, during this period. Now, at the same time, remember I talked about culture and command team. Well, if you go to Sherman's headquarters, it's a very different story. There, Sherman thinks, I'm satisfied. Had our troops been a little more experienced, it would have worked. Definitely would have worked. Definitely on the inexperience of the troops. His, his uh, adjutant says, I mean, given experience in ordinary officers, we would have succeeded because the troops were good. That's just the officers didn't know what they were doing and you know, all these coordination problems. But in general, the bayonets would have Carried the breast of Sherman and his acolytes are firm believers that the bayonet is the way that you carry positions. Not by pointing away with skirmishers, but you mass people together, 
put them in a column and drive them directly at the decisive point and you will eventually break through. It's a very Napoleonic idea, somewhat out of step. It, it, definitely out of step in all occasions, uh, but, but uh, or, or definitely not out of step in all occasions, but certainly out of step in, in many certain problems. Sherman thinks it's, it's, a, it's a panacea for everything. So there's this beginning of a disjuncture between what the troops think is tactically efficacious and what those at headquarters think is tactically efficacious. That's a problem, right? So Sherman gets together with, uh, with Admiral Porter, who's commanding the gunboats uh, in the, the, the naval arm of the flotilla. And they say, well, what we need now is a victory. We need a, just an easy victory, because everybody's sad, everybody's depressed, everybody feels like uh, you know, we just lost a major battle, and we need something that's going to kind of gird us for the capture of Vicksburg. And so they find this, this, this little rebel fort, Fort Hyman, which is on the Arkansas River, back the other way on the Mississippi. And the hope is that by seizing this fort, uh, which should be easy, because they massively outnumber the rebel garrison, that they can build morale. So, so they steam up back up the Mississippi, steam in the Arkansas, disgorge the entire multiple corps that are in the flotilla now on the dry land, and then they, they get arrayed and, and prepared to assault the fort and, and a measly trench which is cut from the fort by the rebels the night before. They don't even have shovels. They use their bayonets like that to dig some ditches in order to hide in behind and engage the attack. So the 15th Corps represents this arm of, of the attack. And needless to say, because of the same coordination challenges, and because all of these troops are just fresh off of attacking breastworks unsuccessfully, that they don't have a whole lot of confidence in what they're doing, even though the assumption is that they're just going to roll over this, this rebel host, which they certainly have the numbers to accomplish. Unfortunately, anything but that happens. The biggest problem being that the terrain involved tended to catalyze each of these attacks in a way that, again, because of the lack of coordinated processes, each of these little regiment, two or two or three regiment groups arrives at the rebel line at a different time. And so all of the rebels up and down the line who can even see them arriving can direct their fire on that, that contingent, likewise here, likewise here. And so all of them are pushed down in front of the abatis, which is these should the tree right here, these, these just basically sticks and trees that are down in order to be entanglements. That's the only cover, right? And so all these troops go to ground in front of the Chevelle de Frey or the Abati, and they begin to fire away at the rebels, but they're not advancing any further. They won't carry the works regardless of the fact that the trenches are literally cut the night before with bayonets. Uh, they're at point blank range, but they don't have the confidence. The officers try everything in their power to get them to get up and get through the entanglements and get into the trenches, and they absolutely refuse. Now, fortunately for the Union Army, there's so much coordinated problems on the rebel side that the fort surrenders inadvertently, and while the troops in the trenches continue to fight, and the troops in the trenches don't get the word that the entire rebel army is surrendering until later, and then gradually, by the time everybody surrendered, even though they did it by mistake because they were winning, that the Union Army carries the trenches, they carry the fort, and it's considered a victory, even though for the troops that were terrified of moving any far forward, they see it very differently. Historians have often written about Arkansas Post as this glorious Union victory, but the troops say, right, if we would have stood up, every ball would have cut a road through our ranks. Uh, and and you know, Lieutenant Withrow in 25th Iowa says, I think experience has finally taught these guys, the generals, that it's better to be a month taking Vicksburg without losing 50 men than taking an hour with a loss of 5,000, which is what it feels like we're doing by just massing together and charging these lines. Meanwhile, at headquarters, they're in the story. Ah, uh, fighting compared to Shiloh was not a good quail hunt, one of Sherman's aide de camp says. Sherman himself says it was not a battle, but a clean little affair of success perfect. Uh, but yet I have seen no troops that can be made to assault. He doesn't understand why don't they have the vim necessary to carry breastworks. He says nothing about the coordination problems that all of the troops say. He says nothing about the fact that, well, they've been repulsed on two different occasions now, so maybe they're losing confidence. 
Maybe they're losing confidence at what Ardon Le Pic, a, a French uh, theorist and, and officer, would write about um, later in the century as the supreme moment, which is where an assaulting force reaches those entanglements in front of uh, some, some trenches and takes the first volley of enemy fire into their teeth and has to gird themselves for going through that fire and into the trench, right? That's where, nine times out of 10, an attack faltered, was the defenders would hold their fire, hold their fire, hold their fire until they were within, you know, 50 meters or so, and then they would fire all up and down the line directly into the face of the attacker, which understandably is very persuasive in terms of not wanting to continue. They would all fall down at that supreme moment and refuse to go any further. The supreme moment is when tactical culture was key. That's when it was absolutely imperative that a unit believed in its capacities to succeed, and if they didn't have that, then at least hadn't gone through multiple experiences of failing, that's going to, as soon as you're there shot at, go to ground and start firing uh, in, in a way that's gonna keep the enemy's head down and isn't realistically going to lead to any kind of meaningful conclusion. So after Arkansas Post is, is a disaster, um, <clears throat> this corps is, is moved southward again down toward Vicksburg. Grant finally arrives with the rest of the army. And they begin the process of trying to figure out how they're going to get Vicksburg in order to reopen the Mississippi River uh, to, to Union commerce. They go through a, a series of failed attempts and, and uh, plans that are, are kind of harebrained schemes that are, are famous in the literature, but I don't need to go into the great length here. What's important for our story is that the 15th Corps was camped during this period in the winter of 1862-63 here at Young's Point, Louisiana, which is just, east, just west excuse me, of the river uh, near Vicksburg. And they were in the process of digging this canal, which was another ill-fated venture and attempt to just move the river away from the city in a way that would just make Vicksburg an inland town so it didn't matter anymore wasn't gonna work, was never going to work, and then digging into it wasn't going to work, but they still attempted it anyway. But what's important is that while camped here at Young's Point, in a swamp, if you've ever been there, you know it's extraordinarily low land, immediately next to the river, it floods all the time. Uh, it's, it's 1862 and 63, so medical advances aren't you know, what we would expect today. And in the process of just camping here, the Army, the, I'm sorry, the 15th Corps loses to death, disease discharge, uh, desertions, 3,500 men, which is about the equivalent at the time because these regiments had shrunk a lot, so they were down to about 250 people or whatnot, or, or, or 150 people strong. It's about 10 regiments worth of volunteers that were lost just to camp in here. So as that shrinks these regiments, their ability to exert mass in attacks is degraded even further. So now they have to rely even more on other tactics in order to be successful on the battlefield in ways that they already were feeling like they weren't likely to be successful. So another experience that uh, they simultaneously have over the course of two different events during this period, the first being a, an attempt to uh, take a smaller flotilla through this ridiculously wide and fine path in order to land over here and then flank Vicksburg, which is it's just absurd on its face, and both of these officers know it's absurd on its face because this is what the train looks like. Uh, I mean, that's literally the, the creek. It's not, it's not gonna happen. They're looking at it, it's not gonna happen. And lo and behold, they get the boats about halfway through, they get stuck, and then have to rush in to, to save uh, the flotilla from being captured by, by the rebels. But in the process of leaving that area, and then in another raid further north, they decide, all right, well, all these rebel troops trying to steal our boats are in league with the planters in the area who are sending their slaves out to cut down these trees that you saw in the last picture and block the way to trap the boats. And so these planters are using the slaves in the interest of rebel military ends, and therefore the slaves are contraband of war. They're being used for military purposes, and so thus uh, although the Emancipation Proclamation has been uh, issued at this point by January of 63, the assumption is we are well within our bounds to seize these slaves, to burn the cotton that is being sold to help the, the rebels in Vicksburg, and moreover, 
to burn the corn or seize the corn, which is being grown and shipped directly to the Roman garrison in Vicksburg. Now, the soldiers who were engaged in this, the same ones who have been repulsed from Chickasaw, repulsed from Arkansas Post, uh, look at this and say, you know what? These, these slaves are incredibly happy to be free. And these people who are supporting the folks who were firing at us at Chickasaw and Arkansas Post are really mad. So we are clearly affecting their morale and their interest in prolonging this conflict, and none of us are dying. We're not being shot at. We're not, you know, any of those things are happening, and yet we seem to be having a much more salient effect on the outcome of the war. And so Captain Sewell Farrell says, you know what, I think with this policy, we're going to crush the rebellion, and we'll continue to crush it, even if we're repulsed from all the strongholds. So it doesn't even matter so much what we do on the battlefield, this captain thinks. It's all about what damage we can do to the, the, the economy that is undergirding the rebellion itself. And even Sherman says, you know what, yeah, 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 we're doing good. We, we damaged a lot, we, we, we consuming a lot, and the planners are just really not into this. So you've got a very conservative officer, politically conservative officer, who's beginning to see the light that maybe the way to accomplish this is not to just go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these folks on every battlefield that we can. It's actually more useful to get at them in the, the soft underbelly, if you will, of the rebellion and sap their capacity to even keep troops in the field to begin with. So from this, they transition into the campaign for Vicksburg, which is a very fabled ca campaign, one of the most brilliant examples of operational art in American military history where Grant takes the entire army, runs the guns with the boats by Vicksburg, and then uh, you know, ferries them across down, down here at Grand Gulf, uh, and then moves west or east to, to Jackson, and then fights civil battles coming back here to Vicksburg. Not enough time to get in to all that. In fact, the 15th Corps doesn't actually engage in any of those battles along the way to Vicksburg. There's, there's multiple other corps in Grant's army. They all fight, they fight at Raymond, they fight at Champion Hill, and then eventually they make their way to Vicksburg. What the 15th Corps does do on this, this uh, parade in the Mississippi, if you will, is they are handpicked by Grant to destroy the military capacity of Jackson as its state capital. And the entire objective is, as you see, it's a, it's a rail nexus, destroy the tracks, Burn anything in Jackson that could be used by the rebels, don't just burn the town down itself, but burn down anything that could be used by the rebel military, destroy the tracks in every uh, direction, and initially catch up to the rest of the army because we've got stuff to do over here at Vicksburg to take down that garrison. So they do, they do a good job, right? When they get to Vicksburg, the whole thing is ringed with much more elaborate trenches and works than the 15th Corps has ever seen. And what do you think the first plan is by, uh, by when it comes to Sherman and Ulysses S. Grant? Unfortunately, exactly. Uh, uh, Grant assumes that, uh, that the rebels have been defeated at, at, at several battles prior to this moment. So certainly they're weak, certainly they're, you know, they don't have a lot of, of, of fight left in them. And as it turns out, they have a lot of fight left in them, as the unfortunate souls who were tasked with charging these breastworks had, had long uh, found out the hard way on the 19th of May in 1863. Once more, hundreds killed. Uh, and then uh, a couple days later, the assumption is that, OK, well, that just didn't go the way it was meant to because uh, we attacked kind of piecemeal. Imagine that, right? We lacked coordination, unlike ever before. Uh, and, and again, the headquarters doesn't recognize fully that things need to be done at the junior levels to maximize and improve those coordination challenges. But instead, it's tried again with all sorts of, not to, to you know, in, in the interest of time, not to go into terrible amounts of detail. But these two divisions, this one attacks, this is the second division, it's Morgan Smith's division, uh, wasn't there at the time, but it's still his division in Illinois, uh, attacks at one point time of day, and then although they were supposed to happen at the same time, Steele's first division attacks hours after this one was repulsed completely. So clearly, there's just at the macro level dramatic coordination problems. Steele just rushes his troops directly up this ridiculously steep incline uh, to trenches at the top that are just literally stand there and plank off Union soldiers as they, they become visible at the top of the height. Very similar things happen over here. There's a dramatic episode with a, a body of men who are volunteers who attempt to carry ladders 
uh, long ahead of the rest of the, the force that they get trapped at the, at the base of Stock Acre Dam. And the whole thing, once again, is an absolute disaster. Sergeant Major White down in the third Missouri says, it was Sherman's order and blood had his man man was responsible for a thousand more lives, mainly in foolishly sacrificed. Captain Jacob Richter says, I don't think they're getting any more charges made because the men just can't be made to do it. Like this is the last straw for these guys. They have decided, I can't take this anymore and we're gonna have to find another way of doing business. Well, they do find another way of doing business. So Grant and his army decide that, all right, no more assaults, no more charges, because this just isn't working. For whatever reason, and again, they disagree on why. Sherman and Grant still thinks Grant even has the gall to say that. Well, the men wanted to charge so badly that if I wouldn't have let them, they would have been really upset about it. He says that in the memoirs, which is just patently absurd. And we know that because you can look at what the men are saying literally on the day of, God, I hope he doesn't ask us to charge these works because we're all going to die. Needless to say, they decide to turn to a siege. They decide to gradually and incrementally dig their way toward the Vicksburg works in order to carry them the slow way. And while they're doing that, the men are engaged in what they call sharpshooting. They are constantly uh, fusillading the rebel works with rifle fire from protected positions like this individual over here behind the loophole, and the rest of them are reading Harper Swickley casually. Uh, smoking their pipe. And this, according to these guys, along with burning corn and uh, emancipating uh, enslaved peoples, is the way to do business. This is the way to fight this war, right? I mean, the rebels are running out of food, and we've got them surrounded, and we're winning, clearly. Nobody's, you know, on our side, very few of us are, are dying in the process, so this looks pretty good. And more, moreover, our men are given a, a great opportunity to become a good marksman than they would have ever had without such practice. I mean, they're bringing thousands of rounds through their rifle. Uh, and they become almost perfect in finding their range. This is one of the best in training schools for engineering and gunnery known in modern times. Right? It's not a school, but it's an actual operation. But they are learning from experience, and that experience is changing them into fundamentally different kinds of troops. And this comes to a head during the next campaign for Chattanooga, well, after Vicksburg falls on the 4th of July of 1863, and the Corps goes back to Jackson to do a little more railroad tearing up. They, they, they were shipped to the east. The steel is replaced by Brigadier General Peter Osterhaus, who takes a page from Morgan Smith's book and changes 1st Division into one that, that looks a lot more like 2nd Division in that they rely ever more on skirmishers and fighting from cover and using dispersed formations. You remember those, those, the, the, the difference between the mass battle line and the skirmishers. Well, one of the key tactical culture aspects is how much emphasis is placed on, on the attack. What do the skirmishers do? Do they go out and attack on their own and just wait for the main line to sweep up to them? Is the main line the one that's really going to do the attacking, or is the skirmishers what's really going to do the attacking? There's a difference of opinion. But with Osterhaus and with Smith, and the experiences of the men in, in failing in these mass assaults, ever increasingly more and more attention is placed on the skirmishers. And the main line in that is ever increasingly only serving to feed more men up to the skirmish line instead of ever assaulting in mass themselves. And this is a very busy map, I understand. There's a lot going on. But what's important is that there's, there's two separate uh, the 15th Corps is divided for various reasons during this battle. Uh, uh, Osterhaus's division, 1st Division, Steele's old division, are attacking here at Lookout Mountain. They're sweeping across the valley and they're rolling up the rebel left flank on Missionary Ridge. While at the same time, or shortly before, uh, Smith's old division and elements of others are attacking at, at what's called Billy Go Kill over on the, on the rebel right flank. Very dramatic episode of getting to Billy Goat Hill that we don't have time to go into. But the key is that Sherman gets orders to occupy Billy Goat Hill and threaten the rebel right. The assumption is that once it's seen that he's there, the rebels will leave. When he gets on Billy Goat Hill, the rebels, once he realizes that they don't leave, Grant gives him orders to attack. Now, normally, as we've seen, Sherman would be very happy to oblige. In this situation, Charles Ewing, his foster brother actually, is commanding one of these 
uh, divisions on, on that wing says, you want me to, you want me to just assault this, this hill just head on, even though we know they're up on top of it, it's a strong height with, uh, with, with works on top of it. And Sherman says, a reporter hears him say, if you like, if you can. Which is not exactly a ringing endorsement of his belief in the efficacy of this particular tactic, right? Very different from everything that he said before. Sherman is gradually coming to believe that unless there is no other alternative, as there unfortunately would be at Kennesaw Mountain, in 1964, it's not best to use these troops to just mass them and attack. And of course, they attack Missionary Ridge on that on that wing. They are mercilessly repulsed by the rebels. Well, meanwhile, on the other flank, Osterhaus's division meets with incredible success for reasons that we'll go into here in a minute. And this final battle that I'm going to talk about today, which is the Battle of Ringo Gap in November of 1863, a very fascinating thing happens. So. The Union Army at Chattanooga is divided loosely in between the, the soldiers that came from Vicksburg and then soldiers that came from the Eastern Theater in the Army of Potomac. And they fought at Antietam, and they fought at the of Gettysburg. Uh, and these troops are mixed for the very first time at, during the Chattanooga campaign, and, and they are most directly connected to one another on the field. And this little episode that happens up here on the northern end of the field, with the 25th Iowa, who we've seen many quotes from, are dispersed as skirmishers with orders to take this, this, this mountain. And they're cautiously advancing, feeding more men up into the skirmish line. They're not, they have orders to seize the mountain, but they're not going to just jam together with bayonets and try to carry it in force, in mass. Meanwhile, because Hooker, the, the, the federal commander in control of this situation, gets frustrated because he's, he's from the east. And he's seen very different battles unfolding in the Eastern Theater. And he wants to see more mass bayonets, and he's tired of waiting and just take the, the, the hill. So he sends Craig's Brigade, who are also Westerners, but they're from the Army of the Potomac. They have a very different background that I don't have time to go into, but they're drilled the same way, on the same manual, right? They don't have different tactics manuals. But they've had very different experiences, most of them of success in mass bayonet charges. And so they attempt to go at this problem in the way that they're accustomed. And while they're doing it, these islands from the 15th Corps look at them and say, what? What are these? They're going to get mercilessly slaughtered if they go up this way. And the officer rides over them and says, hey, you guys got to, no, you got to send out skirmishers. That's not the way you do this. And they brush them aside and they say, no, dude, we're going to teach Western troops how to fight here. Uh, you know, you're just being cowards, picking your way up the side of the hill, and we're about to show you that we need business. So they attempt. And they get slaughtered, and the entire thing falls apart. They come rushing down the hill. And in the aftermath, well, James Williamson, who's with the island, says, Well, we were, we were approaching by skirmishing and cautiously advancing, but these Easterners showed up, and they failed not because they were cowards, but because of the way in which they attempted to go up the hill, he said, which was nonsensical to him and the others in ways that a year prior wouldn't have been nonsensical. And that's entirely a product of his experience and the experience of his soldiers, not what it said in tactical manuals or, or anything like that. These Easterners were, were watching uh, these, the, the, the 15th Corps attack on, on Lookout Mountain. They said they, they attacked like rats, broke all up, but the pieces kept going independently. Uh, there were others that said every rifleman kind of fought for himself or in small groups, which is very alien to these Eastern troops. Well. This is the way the 15th Corps would continue to fight throughout the rest of the war, most famously in the Atlanta campaign and then the Carolinas campaign. This is actually a lithograph drawn uh, by a, a wartime correspondent who was sketching the 15th Corps attack at Osaka in Georgia in 1864. And as you see, there's no mass lines here. The mass lines are present. They're behind these individuals. But what's different is that these individuals aren't going to fall back into those lines. This is the tip of the spear. This is what the 15th Corps front looks like, and these are the individuals who are going to attack that line out there. When they defend, once again, they're not all massed together. They're all knelt down. They're, 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 uh, they're laying down. Sometimes they, they fire. They run a little bit. They lay down. They get back up while others are firing to cover them. It looks a lot more, not identical, but a lot more like we, we could look at as modern infantry tactics today. So after the war, this is going to bring it back full circle to Lebanon. 
about a couple decades and some change after the war, uh, an individual by the name of Arthur Wagner, a uh, very famous uh, soldier scholar and taught at uh, the equivalent of CGSC now, the school of application back then in the general service school, uh, wrote a book, a very influential textbook that was used at, at this staff college called Organization and Tactics, in which he looked at Morgan Smith's tactics in the 15th Corps and said, these, these skirmish heavy tactics are the dawn of the tactics of the present day. He says, this is what we really need to be moving toward in order to be more effective with modern weaponry and modern technology in, in, in the future of warfare. And he is very influential, he's quite even certain on the board, but he was very influential on the board that drafted these, which is the 1891 update, if you will, of this tactics manual that you have in front of you, which, as you see, emphasizes all of the things that were a part of what the 15th Corps learned from experience. There's a lot of kneeling and laying down the fire. There's uh, you know, the, the mass main column, but really most everything is going on up here in, in, the, in the skirmish ranks, and the, the, the rear mass feeds those skirmishers. So there were many other considerations that went into this drill manual, but Wagner's influence and Wagner's view of what had happened in the Civil War, not something that went terribly wrong, as the conventional view of why they're just standing there shooting at each other in lines, but rather a, a, uh, you know, a conflict that you could look at the end of it and say there was a lot of learning that went on here that was specific to certain units who had gone through certain experiences, and we can draw from that uh, in, in order to understand the things that we need to do to harness that experience and then maximize our effectiveness going forward. So I really thank you for your time. And uh, my, my, the book will be out uh, in the fall by, by LSC Press. It's called Social Show Experience, Lord of Sherman's 50th Army Corps. And uh, that's all I got. So thank you. Thank you.